There we go. Welcome to the Pirates of Drainax. We will be picking up where we left off last week with the travelers <clears throat> spending some time on the uh, the floating palace of Drainax. But before we get started, we'd like to thank friend of the Greenwater Guildhall. These are not partnerships or sponsorships of any kind. They're just products that we really like. And tonight we would like to thank the Speechless Bard. Uh, she makes leather products for your tabletop role-playing games, such as uh, leather covers for your core rule books. She has a dice rolling mat that looks like a spell scroll when it's rolled up. Um, it has this really cool new thing called the Spell Compendium that looks like a small spell book. And on one side of it, or the, the main portion of it split in two, one half can be used as a um, uh, holder for cards. The other side it's can be used as a dice tray. And then the back cover uh, on the inside has a magnetic spell uh, slot tracker. It's really pretty neat. Um, if you are ordering, uh, make sure you give yourself a little bit of extra time because she is in the UK. And so things can take a little while to reach us over here across the pond. If you're a fan of our Wednesday Night Traveler games, we do have a website via Obsidian Portal. Uh, the adventure log on that site is written in the manner of Traveler News Service articles. And uh, it deals with pretty much everything going on in the Trojan Reach and some news coming in from the outside. Uh, but as the travelers start to uh, take <clears throat> more and more uh, nefarious actions, they are becoming more and more front page news. If you like the site, please go to the front page and give us a thumbs up. We do like to see those fan likes, and we hope you enjoy the content. So, uh, <clears throat> you guys came back to the uh, floating palace, and uh, and actually, I don't know who did this, but it is a fantastic uh, picture of the floating palace. And um, so you guys came back to the Floating Palace of Drynax, <clears throat> and uh, you're going to spend a little bit of time here. You uh, received, uh, on your way back, um, you stopped, I believe it was in Palindrum, and uh, you somebody bumped into Ox and put a nondiscreet black technological disc in his pocket. And... You guys were real careful about what this disc was. You didn't open it at the wrong time or at the wrong place. And come to find out, this thing uh, was from somebody on Tech World. And they invited uh, you guys. <laughs> and I, I, I say invited. So the first thing that you discovered was that this, this disc has um, a bunch of information all on you guys. Uh, that you may or may not want people to have. Like, it's got your full military records and, you know, any arrest warrants that are for you. And, you know, that one time you got grounded in the third grade and what your favorite type of peanut butter is. I mean, everything's on this desk. And the last part of it was that it opened itself up, kind of origami style. And there's Carrie. Hello, Carrie. Um, it opened itself up, and a hologram came out, and <clears throat> you couldn't see the face of whoever this person was. They were wearing some kind of silver mask, but they invited you to come to uh, Tech World, and uh, they they invited you discreetly to come to De Tech World, where matters of mutual interest and profitability may be discussed. So... <clears throat> You decided that you were going to go back to the Floating Palace first because, um, you know, two weeks from now, uh, the uh, um, Dame Coraline Petrovsky and the Rasputin class that you found on uh, Vimarta is going to be showing up. And uh, you kind of wanted to, well, I mean, let's face it, you guys need a little bit of downtime that's not <clears throat> bouncing around, um nefarious ports of call and being stuck aboard ship. You guys have been shot at and you're probably just now feeling like you're getting back up to 100%. And so, um, you know, here you are at the Floating Palace. Now, when you came back and you basically told uh, King Oleb uh, of what was going on, 
Um, he, of course, is absolutely ecstatic about this. Um, this having a, a 1,000 ton uh, destroyer escort, that's probably outside of 3rd Imperium or Aslan Herate uh, navies, that's probably the biggest ship of any small polity in the, in the subsector, or, or rather in the sector. Um, I don't know, the Florians might have, they, they might have a few, uh, large ships, but, um, no, nobody else is going to have anything this size. Um, so he's absolutely ecstatic. Um, he's also been kind of pushing Ching Shi and Princess Rao to, you know, you guys are, <clears throat> if everything goes according to plan, um, when this is all said and done, um, I'm going to have Ching Shi as a daughter-in-law. And so uh, you two should really be spending some time together. And so Princess Rao uh, kind of conceded that, you know, that probably is a good idea. She kind of, she rolled her eyes. Uh, Princess Rao, I want to say, uh, she's like in her mid-20s. Um, but she acts like... She acts like your typical 15-year-old punk rock goth girl. Um, in fact, I have a picture of her. She even kind of has the punky hairstyle. There she is. This is Princess Rao. Yeah, she... she yeah, she has that whole, you know, I'm too cool for school vibe to her. Um, and in reality, the the whole concept of of the the pirate campaign in order to um, <clears throat> facilitate the new kingdom of Drynax was really her idea. So twenty years ago, uh, King Oleb's son, Prince Herrick, was. Um, he led a, an assault on the planet um, Asim. And things didn't go as planned, and his, his drop shuttle was, uh, was hit by enemy fire. That, that's the official story, is it was hit by enemy fire. Um, and it went down in a burning wreck. And, <clears throat> you know, everybody was sad. They're like, oh my God, no way anybody could survive that. But sifting through the wreckage, um, they found his, his charred husk of a body. And when they got to scanning him medically, discovered that he wasn't really actually dead. I'm not quite dead yet. And uh, so they stuffed what's left of him into a low berth and brought him back to the uh, floating palace in Drynax. And... Uh, Basically, he took the low berth and put it in the Scholar's Tower. And for the last 20 years, the, the medical techs of the Scholar's Tower have been... Um, well, I mean, the only way to say it is they've been putting him back together. Quite, quite literally rebuilding his body uh, cell by cell in a lot of cases. Um, there are... Numerous rumors around court that he doesn't really say much. He he has he has recently been allowed to finally leave the Scholar's Tower, and the party has seen him, or I think at least Beth and Ching Shi have seen him. Um, he doesn't really say much. Um, he he seems to walk very stiffly, um, like he has to concentrate on what he's doing. And there's a, there are rumors around court that, you know, that he's more machine than man. And, you know, nobody really believes that there's a whole lot of the real Prince Herrick left in him. But during this time, there it, it, you know, everything was dicey. And so King Oleb made Princess Rao his heir apparent. And so this whole idea of... Uh, of Rao and Ching Shi getting together uh, is a big deal 
because of course the first thing that will be required um and that can be a discussion between the two of you of who's going to do what but you guys are going to have to go visit the scholars tower and there's going to be dna taken from the two of you and then that's going to be put together and one of you is going to have to carry the the heir apparent to the throne because Rao is going to be at some point queen so um you know that's kind of important <laughs> Let me guess, Carrie's like, mm -mm, not me, not it. <laughs> Knows no goes, yes. So he's excited by this prospect. Um, he doesn't look it. He looks like he's probably in his early to mid 50s, but he's actually like 105, 110 years old. Um, you know, royals and their anagathics. So, <clears throat> in honor of uh, of this whole um, new ship, and there's going to be a new royal at court who's actually not inbred. Um, so, the, <laughs> and I say that only half jokingly. So, when Drynax was bombarded by uh, the Aslan. The Aslan joked and said, you know what, <clears throat> we're going to leave your floating palace and then you could just rule over a destroyed husk of a planet. And that's what they did. Um, I mean, the, the, the starport docks were damaged in that assault and they have never really fully been repaired, which is why uh, the, royal, the royal docks are now basically used as the starport. But all the survivors that were left or were able to be picked up, were put on the on the floating palace. And so everybody on the floating palace is related to everybody else. And because titles are inherited, and there were a lot of titles that were just given out as rewards, everybody on the floating palace is the such and such of somewhere um, as far as like a title goes, everybody, the, the, the janitor that cleans up the Royal bathrooms is like a baron of something. Um, so everybody has a title. And so he's a little bit excited. He's as, well, I would say he's as equally excited, not just by a thousand ton warship now being a part of the dry fleet, but also of an outside noble especially one from Regina in the in the Spinward Marches, coming to court. Yeah, she's only a dame, but <clears throat> um, that, for Drynax, that's a big deal. And, and I have the wrong book open. So he is going to throw a ball in honor of... Um, well, really in honor of all the good news. He's in an exceptionally good mood. Now, there are some people, that survivors, that are still living on, on the surface of Drynax. They are called the Vespexers. They are um, nomadic people. Um, they... They never take off their hostile environment suits. Uh, in a lot of ways, uh, for anybody who's read or seen Dune, they are a lot like the Fremen. Um, they always wear their, their hostile environment suits, never take off their helmets. Even at court, they they don't take them off. And there is one, uh, there is one Vespexer in particular um, that comes to court, and um, her name is Chieftain Gaux, and she is the representative, and she'll come to court whenever Drynak, or excuse me, whenever the floating palace is over that section of, um, or wherever they are of, uh, on the surface of Drynax, when it's overhead, she'll come to court and, uh, you know, I, I guess talk about the plight of the Vespexers, but they usually trade what little agriculture that they have down left on the surface, which is just now starting to come back, for technological advancements and things like that. 
So, <clears throat> another member of the uh, of the court, of course, is Rishondo, uh, which would be at the bazaar, uh, number two. And uh, <clears throat> Rishondo is known at court as being able to get you anything that you could really want. Um, well, almost anything. Uh, the one caveat to that is that, so... He's basically wormed his way into the court of Drynax because Drynax being a small kingdom and, you know, a small kingdom with really nothing to rule, uh, they have very limited funds. And so they've been trading these, they've been giving these ancient Sindalian Empire relics and then telling Rashondo, you know, well, this is what we need. And, you know, can you, can you get that for us? And he takes their relics, he leaves, nobody knows what happens to them, they probably get sold on the black market somewhere, and he comes back with whatever they need. So, he is known for having the ability to uh, get into numerous places. There is another uh, traitor and, and smuggler, um, yeah, really a smuggler, uh, on the floating palace named Sal, uh, Saul Dancet, and... Uh, she is, uh, she's able to obtain rare, rare goods as well. Um, and she has contacts all throughout the Trojan Reach and even here on the Floating Palace, um, you know, she has contacts in the underworld of the, of the Floating Palace. So, like I said, he's going to throw this ball and, uh, <clears throat> that's going to take place in two days time and he's inviting well no it'll take place in a week because he's going to be inviting whoever is within jump range that can attend and uh you know he's putting the the word out um especially he's making sure that <clears throat> uh what is this guy's name the, the imperial consul thou pollock uh thou pollock is a um his, he is the Imperial con Consul that is uh, assigned to the Drynax Court. Um, he, he's kind of out of his depth. Um, he really likes to study the history of Sindal, and he is quick to tell anybody that will listen that this, what we're witnessing right here on the Floating Palace is the last dying breath of a once great empire. He seems to ignore all of the genocide and the killing of their own people and things like that, but, you know, whatever. <clears throat> so, Ching Shi's going to go on her date to the Royal Gardens. So, she'll be down in 13 here. Down here. Rexar, while you are on the Floating Palace, what would you like to do? You can hobnob with other uh, courtiers. Uh, you can go shopping. What would you like to do? Last time we were here, I ordered a gravity hammer. Mm -hmm. That is true. Yes, you did. And I, I mean, it's been a while since you were here. Um, did you prepay for that? Uh, yes. All right. Let me find the flash drive with all the information. There it is. Yes. So, yeah, uh, you can go pick up your gravity hammer. I assume you ordered that from uh, Rashondo. Yeah. There's the flash drive. <laughs> That's interesting. Oh, there it is. So yeah, uh, wow, man. If you're gonna use that instead of your reaver axe, I mean, holy shit, that does a lot of damage. Well, I was thinking you combine the reaver axe and the gravity hammer. That's gonna be difficult. Simply, I mean. Yeah, that's going to be difficult. Oh, but the symbolism. Yeah, no, they, they, 
the reaver axe mixing it with the um, static axe, I could I could see because they're essentially the same thing. Um, but I could turn it into like a halberd. <laughs> yeah, no, th this is a big this is a big hammer that um, with a gravity generator in it. So yeah. Yeah, but what if I just slap an edge on the end? <laughs> no. Damn it. Dual wield them then. So yeah, you can go to the bazaar and see Rashondo about getting uh, your gravity hammer. What would I'll get the gravity hammer? What would uh, Beth and Keith like to do? Uh, so I want to work on the bridge and make it uh, tip top. Okay, and actually, I already have something for Beth. Beth, you are being uh, summoned. Uh, to the King's Privy Council. Oh, crap. Okay. <laughs> you're, you're going to... Uh, he want, uh, King Olib specifically wants you to sit in on the Privy Council. He thinks that you might have some valuable insights. Oh, we'll see. So, for... Dum, 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 dum. Uh, and I have that sheet available. But evidently, I'm still incapable. So I will, uh, you know, after tonight, Keith, uh, you're going to get a copy of this sheet. I'm just going to scan it and send it to you. Um, although, I don't know, we might experiment with Roll20 because now you can do PDFs in Roll22. So anyways, um, but you'll have access to this sheet. But for now, write down a note. Uh, you have 24 structural repair units. You have 18 technical repair units. Okay. And you have 19 cosmetic repair units. Right. Okay. So the bridge, let's see here. It would take 12 repair units, um, or 12 cosmetic repair units, plus two technical repair units, and the bridge, for cosmetic repairs, the bridge would be completely done. New drapes, carpeting. As for time... That's not bad. It, it, the, that, all of that can be done in a week. Nice. For the Capri Sun, right? For yeah, Capri Sun. Yep. Cool. Is, isn't it in Homestead? Well, you know, I thought about that. That occurred to me after um, after last week's game and I am going to hand wave that and assume <laughs> that on the way back you guys would have stopped and come up with a way of bringing it with you whether that be one of you pilot it whatever because you have the ability to do that so so yeah Keith will Keith will be busy for the week um Doing cosmetic repairs to the bridge. Uh, hold on here. Right, 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 right. Sorry. Updating the the sheet so I know what the hell's going on. So that leaves you with 12 structural repair units and uh, looks like uh, 16 technical repair units. Oh, 
Wait, no, sorry. My bad. I'm sorry. Uh, 24 structural repair units, uh, 16 technical, and 7 cosmetic is the actual mm -hmm. correct amount. Correct. Yes, I got it. Okay. Ting, what would you like to do? I think I want to try to hire a, uh, a salvage expedition to go to the system that we just did to pick up that scout ship and uh, to loot all of the, the buildings that were there around the Royal Palace hangar and all that. Maybe, you know, spend a little extra money that they could uh, beware of possible clone assassins right so, about. So, okay. So that brings up, you don't really need to hire anybody to do that. You guys have pirate ships. Um, and you have crews that are fairly capable of doing that. And you have, during your last week in uh, drive space, or uh, drive space, wrong game, jump space, uh, you, you were kind of alerted to the... Um, to an issue in that essentially your uh, current little army of pirates, your little fleet is actually costing you more money than what they're pirating and bringing in to the tune of, I forget the exact amount, but it was like 460,000 credits a month. So, right. You guys need to deduct 460,000 credits from your um, from your ship fund. And uh, so, I mean, that kind of, that's for this month. So, <laughs> and it's not really, uh, it's not really through any fault of their own. They're small ships. But because they, you know, it's not like they're working on consignment. I mean, if they were doing that, why would they need you? And so they basically hired on. And so their wages have to be paid. The ship's maintenance has to be paid, um, yada, yada. And most of these ships are small. So it becomes very difficult for them to pull a profit. This is why most, this is the number one reason why most pirate bands remain to be a small fleet if they have multiple ships. And of course, the second reason being that large fleets are easier to track and hunt down. So what you could do um, is send them, and this is going to kind of, and you're hoping that if they can salvage this Donisev class, that will end up more or less resolving that problem for a couple of months. Yeah, hell yeah. So, um, and you said you wanted them to also go down and try to loot the surface as well? Oh, fuck yeah. There's a lot of TL-15 and uh, gear down there, uh, a big-ass complex, you know? Right. I mean, there's some assassin people that, you know, they need to go there with a kill-on-site type attitude. Uh, but that place needs looting. Okay. Uh, very, and, and, yeah, I mean, I know I remember hearing about some damaged combat armor and stuff and hangers just on the surface there that should be easily accessible uh you know and uh, if they if they went there and, and found other places to loot or to you know check out uh, that'd be great they could they could scan the uh the high port that got destroyed and see if there's salvageable crap for there possibly just for scraps or whatever i mean uh, they they really need to get those fucking cargo bays fucking full and get to moving, um, you know, fucking up the ship's budget and all that shit. Yeah. They, they need to get, yeah. They, so they really do. They need to go get that. It, the, if the scout covers their thing for a couple months without fucking up the ship's fun, I'm all for that. I, I just thought it was fun to steal their ships. Uh, so. <laughs> okay. So that's what you're doing. Ox, I know that you wanted to go shopping. Yep, ammo. Ammo. Well, actually, some other stuff that I need to add to our uh, 
contacts. I'll give them a shopping list. It'll probably take them a while to get. Okay. All right. So you're you're wanting ammo. Uh, specifically, you want heap rounds. Uh, learning your your lesson from uh, <laughs> from last time. So. Can we have custom outfits made for the ball? Uh, oh, since it's a week, you certainly. Know, I do. I need a formal outfit to wear for the ball. Certainly. Uh, as as a star dragon knight, and yeah, you're still definitely. So, so yeah. Um, so it would cost each of you for your special outfits. Um, we'll say a thousand credits. To have uh, your your custom outfits made, um, and uh, <clears throat> that for for an ad, for if you have a title such as uh, Rexar and Tang, who are Knights of Egdesil, um, for an extra five hundred credits, they will include all of your um, basically fruit salad and uh, insignias uh, and whatnot. So for if you have a title, fifteen hundred will will cover. That expense. Can I get that title and my clan crest? Yeah, you certainly Sweet. can. <clears throat> so, <laughs> so Cheng Shi, you go to the to the royal gardens. Now, <clears throat> you expect these royal gardens to be, you know, royal gardens. Um, on the floating. Palace, um, they they're not like what you would expect. The royal gardens on the floating palace are actually have been can, turned into hydroponics. So most of the um, well, a good portion of the food is grown right here in the royal gardens. Um, food, and, I mean, I, I would say probably a third of the food is grown here in the Royal Gardens. The rest of it comes from a seam. And uh, they, uh, it, it's a maze of hydroponics. There's not a whole lot of flowering plants. I mean, I, zucchini flower, don't they? <laughs> I think. Um, yeah, there's, you know, lettuce, cabbage. Um, you know, a, lot of, a lot of vegetables, some fruit trees. But not the... It seems like that would still be impressive because I spend most of my time on oh, ship. Oh, 100%. Eating, like, reconstituted mushroom protein Right, yeah, whatever. right, yeah. Uh, flavor packets uh, poured over varying portions of soy. Um, Rao meets you. Uh, there, is, there are two fountains... And she meets you under one of them. And even the fountains um, have been repurposed. Their water their water filtration system, they still have a little bit of a, a fountain effect, but it's mostly to, to water the plants right in their vicinity. A lot of the water is pumped out to irrigate the rest of the gardens. And so uh, she, you can see this and, and you, you can just look at it and you're like, Man, if he got rid of all of this duct tape and, you know, rigged aquarium tubing, this must have been really impressive and just absolutely beautiful with the hanging flowers and whatnot. And it's, of course, still impressive, but not quite the the royal beauty that you would expect. And, and Rao um, kind of confirms that, is that... Uh, she said that when she was a little girl, the the hanging gardens that, that were here were absolutely beautiful. Um, she said she didn't have a whole lot of memory of it. She was very young um, when they turned them into the hydroponics. And uh, the whole thing that led to her brother being um, so badly injured was that the, the garden suffered a blight. And a seam was their only chance for getting food and the foundation turned them down the foundation being the government that runs a seam and so um, her father had little choice but to invade and uh, a seam is now considered a chattel world 
um, under Dryanax's direct control, but um, she wishes things would have turned out better. And so you and uh, you and Rao kind of spend your time walking through the gardens, kind of getting to know one another. Um, you seem to come to an understanding of one another. Um, she's a fairly complex individual. Do you have any questions for her? Or is there anything that you really like to know? Um, I guess my first question is, like, what does she think about her dad's mission? Like, is she on board or ambivalent or? Well, I mean, it was her idea. Um, and she, she, of course, she's very on board. Um, she, so <clears throat> she's completely on board. She tells you, um, and, and she, she chuckles and says, well, I, I understand that, uh, uh, you have run afoul of uh, General Rax um, or Admiral Rax on a number of occasions. He's the commander of the Star Guard that wanted the Harrier as his flagship. And she says, uh, don't worry, he's not a fan of me either. In fact, there are many, including him, that, that believe that I'm overly ambitious, that I'm trying to reach, I'm, I'm pushing my father to reach too far uh, for Drynax, and that will never succeed. But she says, I th think if if the reports are true of what you are accomplishing, I believe that we are succeeding. You know, even if it's small steps here and there. But we are succeeding in building our kingdom. So my plan is obviously working. Okay, well, does she have any thoughts on how to bag bigger planets than where what we've managed? Because so far, you know, they're they're cute, but they're armpit. <laughs> and she she laughs and she says, "Well, you you might end up being disappointed because most of the Trojan Reach is an armpit." <laughs> um, uh, as far as getting bigger planets. Um, just at, because at some point, at some point, our disruption is not going to be enough. And so I guess what's the plan when we re reach the point that our just messing with people isn't enough? She says, um, make a, make a, make a persuasion plus, uh, your choice, either social or charm. Oh, God. Oh, my can it be like intellect? Can I try and ask smarter instead? Yeah, I'll let you use intellect. Yes. Okay. Uh, let's see. Where's my end? Uh, 13. So she, she kind of winks at you and she says, I like the way you're thinking. And she says, well, as far as gaining bigger planets, I don't know, I don't really know how you would go about it, but if you could bring in Birney, that would be great. Because Birney is the last vestiges of the true Sindalian Star Guard. Basically, the Star Guard of Sindal went to Birney and said, We're going to hold out here until a legitimate emperor is crowned. And so she says, if you can convince them that my father is the legitimate emperor of Sindal, then um, they would come over to our side. They have a lot of uh, tech. They have a lot of old Sindalian ships. In fact, they have uh, schematics and blueprints. They're actually building new Harriers and mm -hmm. others, and Rorik's command ships and, you know, old Sindalian vessels. Um, so that would be a huge feather in our cap. She says, but you're right. Sooner or later, um, it's not going to be enough, uh, for you guys to be harassing trade through the sector, through the sector. Um, she says, but I have 
a plan to assist with that. Okay. She says, "I, you'll, you, I will allow, I will let you know when it, when the time is right." Okay. Wait. Any other questions? I don't know what else to ask. Okay. What kind of is there any uh, other any new backing to support your father's claim? Uh, Meaning, like, what what evidence in the record is there, or is that something that can be obtained to convince Birney uh, that his claim is legitimate? <clears throat> there is there is evidence that um, I mean we have we have uh, evidence in the Scholars Tower proving Oleb's claim, but that okay. but there's nothing solid that doesn't prevent. For instance, uh, the Golden Queen of Yggdrasil from making the claim either. Or uh, she says, <laughs> believe it or not, on Old Noricum, there is an old man who is a direct descendant of the last Sindalian emperor, who technically would be the, the emperor. She says, I, I heard that he like grows turnips. Um, but aside from, from that, she's like... It's not like any of their claims are any, are any stronger or any different than my father's. Mm. So at that point, it really becomes more of a diplomatic struggle of, you know, who can who can woo them the best. Speaking of wooing, has your father tried to woo the Golden Queen? Um, they through courier. Um, the Golden Queen has signed a, a agreed to sign a um, mutual defense treaty for the Trojan Reach as a whole. Um, oh, I mean, like, I mean, woo, like Marvin Gaye, woo. Oh, like, no. If you, if they, if they, if they could stomach it and consolidate through a, a political marriage, then they would have twice as much claim as anyone else. She she stops and thinks and, and looks at you and she says, that's very true. Um, she here's the problem with that though. And mm -hmm. and she says, I don't if that were to take place, it, let's let's say that they did that and and produced an heir. My life would be in in jeopardy. My brother's life would be in jeopardy, and probably all of your lives would be in jeopardy. There would be ways to make sure that a new heir was not produced. <laughs> Slip condoms <laughs> into the royal chambers. <laughs> something, something to keep in the back pocket as a backup plan, because if there are multiple parties that have a single claim, then coming forth with twice as much of a claim would be uh, highly effective. That is true. That All right. that's a very good point. Okay. Finally, uh, Ching Shi, make a recon plus intellect check. I was going to say, and then I'm going to give her a don't tempt me in speech, and oh, that's not good. Okay, three, five, seven, three, I, I blew my chance. Okay. To eat little anything. Okay, so we'll come back to you in just a moment. Ox, do you have your shopping list yet? Uh, like I said, I, I don't need that today. Okay. So I'll go. Um, but I would, you know, we just got a, a nice big payout. Yeah. So I'm going to take, uh, you know, get some nice clothing. Yeah. Um, uh, I think I got everything else I need that. So I'm going to take 50000 of that, and I'm going to go party and gamble. Okay. Whether I come back with any or not, that. Immaterial. So, I mean, it's always good to win, but the gambling is what's there. Being a varger, um, Ox's idea of nice clothing <laughs> is 
it is almost blinding to everybody else. There's like a cacophony of different colors, all extremely bright, very garish. Um, as far as going and gambling, you do find um, that there are some um, um, there are some street games going on, like in the bazaar. Um, there's no actual, you know, um, official casinos, but there's some there's some tents and whatnot that are set up that uh, that cater to the whole. Uh, you know, dice rolling, small card games, things like that. Um, any uh, use carouse and recon and see if there's any. You know, like in the fancy hotels. You know, like I found that uh, Admiral's game last time. Right. Go ahead and make I'm a looking for a high price poker game somewhere. Go ahead and make a streetwise check. Okay. Uh, okay. I hate how roll 20 drops that last thing where it's a pain in the butt to get to for input other values. Right, yes. 12. Okay. <clears throat> so you do find a uh, you do find a game going on. Um, and let's see here. So you find a, uh, it is a game between uh, the Hawk Warriors. Well, the Hawk Warriors are uh, King Oleb's personal, um, they're, his, they're his personal guard. And uh, these guys all wear the uh, recon battle dress, very similar to what Ching Shi uses, with with uh, gravity belts and things like that. Um, King Oleb likes to go flying around with the hawk wearers, except King Oleb's girth is big enough that he has to wear two gravity belts. And, uh, you know, there are a number of uh, underhanded compliments to, uh, about the, the, uh, the queen, the king's great girth. Um, and, uh, but these hawk warriors, they are having a, uh, a game in the, uh, in their barracks, which would be, uh, number 12. Number 12. Sounds like a good spot. So yeah. I like you, that number. Yeah. You are, <laughs> you are over in the 12 area, um, enjoying a, uh, rousing game. You know, I have an idea. Let's see. I will do this. This way we know where everybody's at. That is a big change sheet. <clears throat> All right, so Ox is going to go gamble. The captain is with the king at the Privy Council. Rexar is at the bazaar. Getting ready to smash stuff. Probably just itching to try out that gravity hammer. 
and Keith. Who's up here at the Royal Docks working on the bridge? All right. That's better. Now we know where everybody's at. So, Beth, <clears throat> you, uh, you're summoned uh, to the Privy Council, um, which consists of <clears throat> King Oleb. Um, normally, Princess Rao would be here, but she's, she's off right now. So, Oleb, Lord Rax, uh, Scholar Voha, um, Cassil of the Arroy Eve, uh, who is uh, Aslan Exile, um, he's basically been led into the court um, and is currently working as Oleb's bodyguard, of all things. Um, Imperial Consul Thal Pollock. <clears throat> There's a woman named Lady Hill. Um, she is an influential noble in court, um, but she's a very, very much a snob, and she's not particularly... Um, happy that you've been invited. Um, Lady Hill doesn't really have uh, much time for anybody that can't trace their lineage all the way back to old Sindal. Um, so, you know, she she doesn't have time to talk with the help. Um, also here is uh, a, a man named Cleon Hardy. So, Cleon, <clears throat> when when Drynax invaded and defeat and took over uh, a seam. Um, they overthrew what they the, their their government was called the foundation, and Drynax of course overthrew that. But instead of just putting their own nobility to rule the planet to ensure loyalty, they invited the inhabitants to to elect an obbudsman to bring their concerns to the court, and so Cleon was chosen as their representative. He has no fucking clue what he's doing. Um, and he's actually a economist and was a, a TV broadcaster on a scene. So he has no idea what he's doing. He is sitting there nervously kind of fidgeting and uh, just kind of listening and trying to figure out how he fits in. And also present is Chieftain uh, Galks, uh, the Vespaxer representative from the tribes on the surface of Drainax. And so they they bring the uh, the the session to order, and uh, Lord Rax immediately um, comes in with uh, the fact that with with the um, with the Rasputin class destroyer escort this. This will make an excellent flagship. I should be given this ship so that I can command the Star Guard. And uh, the, the everybody at the table just like the the session's just been called to order, and this is immediate. The, the hammer is still warm from striking the gal the the table, and this is what blurts out of Lord Rax's mouth. Um, and Oleb is just kind of looking at him like Jesus, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> right, right. Um, did, do, do you have any thoughts on that uh, situation? Um, it both points to someone else. Uh, what's our friend's name? Damn it. Oh, uh, Dame Petrovsky. Yes, it belongs to Dame Petrovsky. Well, I'm sure that with given uh, titles and... Uh, um, appropriate um, wooing, we can talk her into relinquishing control of that ship. You know what? Go ahead and try. <laughs> Rax, Rax kind of leans back in his chair and is drumming his fingers on the table. He says, well, you're such a successful pirate ca captain. Uh, perhaps you should be the one to broach the subject with her. I don't know if you want me to be the one to do it. I'd have a hard time not saying um, there's a clown that wants to drive your ship around the galaxy. 
<laughs> Lady Hill kind of interjects and she says, well, clearly the pirate has doesn't have the breeding to be talking to a noblewoman from the Spinward Marches. Perhaps I should speak with her. Only if I could be there to watch. <laughs> <laughs> Lady Petrovsky. Chieftain Galx uh, speaks up and uh, <clears throat> says, I, I, or she says, uh, I, I really hate to interrupt this uh, most important conversation about a vessel that doesn't belong to any of you, but um, I still must bring up that uh, the Vespexers are in need of irrigation equipment so that our our uh, sieges can properly grow food. Uh, when can we expect that that aid to come? And Oleb kind of throws up his arms and is like, oh, God's damned it. I can't believe that we're having this conversation again. How many aggregate aggregate how many agricultural units do you do you people need? Isn't the planet providing for you as it is? And, and Galt's just kind of, you can't see her face because it's behind a, a heavily armored helmet, but you could feel her eyes roll. And she says, the planet was bombarded with asteroids. So, I mean, it's not going to be able to do that on its own for another thousand years. We have to coax out of it everything that we possibly can. Um, and... So Oleb turns to Beth and he says, "Well, your pirates have you have you looted any agricultural units lately? Um, Aquifiers, things of that nature." I'm going to go ahead and say no. I didn't know we needed to look for them. He said, "Well, perhaps we should put that on the list of uh, things to to try to raid." Ask around the starport, see if there's anything of that nature. He says, now, uh, here's a question, Beth. Are you telling the council about your invitation to Tech World? Or are you keeping that on the slide? Hmm, I don't know if we're even going. I'm not, I'm probably not going to share that. Okay. I mean, yeah, I feel like that's a good idea, Captain. You don't want to be like, so we got this sneaky file of all the personal information we want to keep hidden. Here's my ink to follow up. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case you all were wondering, we're going to go chase our skeleton. <clears throat> Somebody could come arrest me at any moment. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, if you were looking for um, technology, pretty much of any sort, um, Tech World would be the place to, to ask. So, I mean... Okay, well, I'll, I'll mention an upcoming trip to Tech World, but not that we got a creepy file with all our, all our sorted pasts on it. Okay. Well, I mean, it's not like anybody at the Privy Council would be shocked by your sorted pasts. I mean, that's kind of why they hired you. But... <laughs> actually, you didn't have... You didn't really have much of a sorted past when they hired you. <laughs> I feel like, I don't know, it, it seems like we're vulnerable, I guess. Just because somebody knows so much about each and every one of us. But, right. Um, yeah. And that information yeah. had to come from somewhere. Yeah. So, so he, he says, well, if you're, if, if you're taking a trip to Tech World, perhaps put that on on the uh, on your talking points while you're there. Uh, but definitely, uh, you know, ships carrying agricultural tech uh, should be on your uh, to do list for raids. Um, and pretty much, this is this con this this roundabout conversation of. Uh, you know, these people need money so that they can fix such and such. These people need this tech part to fix this. These people want these people out of their area of the palace. 
Uh, these people are wanting these people to give them something. That kind of conversation just keeps going round and round. And you're kind of left <clears throat> more or less just you're you're feeling more and more for Cleon Hardy because he has no idea how to fit in here. You probably are feeling much the same way. And all of these people are really wanting petty things from a kingdom that can't supply them. So, you know, that's kind of like, oh, well, wish in one hand and shit in the other and see which one fills up first. Um, <clears throat> you all convene back to your, uh, to your royal um, suites, and pretty much the week goes by. Um, Ox, roll a gambling plus intellect check. Okay. Gambling, gambling, gambling. Oh, that's pretty good. So you're able, <laughs> you are able to make uh, throughout the week another 3,000 credits. Okay. Um, can, can I spend that uh, entertaining the uh, people I'm gambling with? You certainly can. You know, buy, I'll bring, buy the pizza, buy the beer. <clears throat> you certainly can. You can spend that buying drinks. Uh, yeah. But, you know, I, I like the Hawk cards. They're, they're a friend of mine. You know? Yeah. By the time that you're done, the, the Hawk Warriors really like Ox. Um, you've plowed them with uh, some of the best wine that you can find at the bazaar. You've uh, basically um, got them all inebriated over the course of the, the past week that they are quite enamored with you. <clears throat> Always good to have the loyal, royal guard happy with you. That's true. That is true. So the, the night of the ball comes. And this is kind of what it looks like in the grand or the great hall. Now, keep in mind, most of these people are actually people that live here, um, but there are a couple of uh, of representatives that have come in. There are a couple of uh, Aslan uh, that have shown up. Um, there are <clears throat> um, representatives from Birney here. Um, there are a couple of uh, nobles from a seam that have shown up. So there, there are a number of people. Uh, there are a couple of familiar faces as well um, from uh, the 3rd Imperium. Um, one being um, a ship has come in <coughs> uh, called... <laughs> you guys know this ship. Uh, it is the Sincerity. Um, Captain Sanistaw is here. Uh, the sincerity has been hunting you guys, but they don't know that they're hunting you guys. They're hunting the, the dastardly brigands that were daring enough to rob from Emperor Strephon by stealing from his treasure ship. And everybody, except for Ching, where did Ching Shi go? <laughs> Dropped down it like a second ago. Oh, uh -huh. well, everybody, there she is. Everybody except for Ching Shi, because we're going to get to her in a minute. Everybody can roll um, a carouse plus soch or charm check. Six for me, not good. I also got six. <laughs> What about Tang? I'm looking at my character sheet. Ooh. Yeah. I remember the captain. Does he remember our last game of Clover? I got a five. Play. Eesh. Gosh, we okay. are, we are <clears throat> some charmers. Rexar, what'd you get? Hold on, I'm looking for my dice. This. <clears throat> you got a ten? No, I said I'm looking for my dice. You said plus Soch? 
Yeah, either Sosh or Charm. <clears throat> was Both a are really bad. Now, because... now, Rexar, in your case, if you want to try to hobnob with the uh, Aslan, you can use your territory score instead. Oh, I'll take the plus four over the minus one. Uh, with the plus four, instead of a seven, it's an eleven. Okay. So, the first thing, so Ox, you're hobnobbing around, and you're actually doing quite well, um, getting to know people. Even Lady Hill is uh, amused by you. I mean, amused is like about the, the extent of it. She still doesn't like you, but you're at least amusing her. Um, Very mutual. You are... Talking amongst many of the people, now there are representatives here from Marduk, um, let's see, what, let's see, Marduk, Torpal, Clark, um, yeah, there, <laughs> there is a, <clears throat> a, uh, what is, what does he call, a psychopomp from, um, Torpal here, and they are, the psychopomps are a religion, they, <laughs> They have a verbal agreement to join the Kingdom of Drynax, and um, part of that verbal agreement is that Prince Herrick will be um, basically become their new space pope. And so they're doing what, you know, they're, they're basically while you're on the court acting like 14th century bishops. Um, and... Uh, but you hear the same thing rumored throughout the ball is that uh, there is a large fear that the Aslan are going to invade and essentially um, that these planet that all of these representatives from these different planets are are talking that they don't have a choice but to join the kingdom of Drynax because if they do not, the Aslan will overrun them. And the overlying belief in this is a treaty that has been released. Um, now, being a part of the crew, I don't know how much the captain has told you guys, but <clears throat> they found on the treasure ship when they looted it a fake treaty. And they have taken this treaty and basically been using it as leverage to get these planets to join. It has had the twofold effect of working, but now everybody's scared. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, the yeah, there's this belief that this treaty is real, and uh, it, it's kind of like you know the flat earthers. <laughs> you know, no matter how many times they're told that the treaty's fake, they're still going to believe that this is the real thing. Rexar, um, you learn uh, two pieces of, of information. The first being that um, um, the Aslan Harry, and, and you know how the Aslan work, they don't work as a single government. They work as individual clans. But you're hearing the same thing. There are three different clan heads here, and you're hearing the same thing from all three of them, that um, there's really no uh, overriding... Uh, desire at this point to do a mass invasion, um, but they are there are plenty of discussions that the Ihati problem uh, is coming to a boil, and these these second sons have to have some place to go. They have to have land, and the only option right now for that would be the Trojan Reach. So, um, there's no, there's no big Aslan, uh, plan to invade, but at the same time, they're, they're not really doing anything to say no to these Ihati. And the second piece of information that you, that you find is that <clears throat> the, the real treaty, um, which basically said that the Aslan won't invade any worlds within, I believe it was within 
uh, 20 parsecs of Imperium space. I might be wrong on that, but it, it's, it's, there's a buffer. Uh, that original treaty, they, they bring up that that was only made with one clan. It wasn't made with the Aslan Harry as a whole. All clans aren't really required to follow this treaty. They're simply following it out of a sense of honor. But they're feeling more and more uh, pressure from these Ihati that, um, you know, maybe maybe we shouldn't follow that treaty. It, it wasn't made with our, with our clan, so maybe our second sons should go and do what they want. All of you have realized that Ching Shi is not at the ball. What? <clears throat> Princess Rao's at the ball, but Ching Shi is is not present. She is absent. I guess we'll ask Princess Rao where she is. Princess Rao uh, tells you. Uh, yeah. Princess Rao, the first thing she's, she says, she, she looks at Beth and she says, that's a, a very lovely outfit you're wearing. You, you, you did quite well with that. But um, I don't know where Ching Shi is. I was hoping that you knew. that She, she should be here. This, this ball is partially about us. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Ching Shi, right. you wake up, and you are I in. I didn't see myself getting kidnapped or something because I rolled so bad for recon. No, no. You wake up, and you are um, in your your formal clothing, like you you got ready to go to the ball. But you are not you are not where you are not anywhere near where you should be. You are in the underbelly, um, the service access tunnels of the floating palace. Okay. And you're you're sitting on your knees, and you realize that you weren't asleep. Your eyes were open, but you don't okay. know how you got here. You are missing time. So I got hit with some kind of uh, psionic thing while my guard was down? You're not sure. No, that's what it sounds like. I'm, that's what I'm putting my money on. Okay. Sitting a couple meter, or not sitting, laying on the, on the deck a couple meters in front of you is a corpse. Awesome. Um, it is a uh, fairly well-dressed individual um, like, like a, a, a tux-like outfit, um, and <clears throat> his throat has been slashed. Is the weapon nearby me? No, but your, but your arm is, has blood on it. Ah, okay. So I went into some stupor and killed him, or it's a Mission Impossible thing. I'm being convinced that I killed him, and then the walls are going to drop, and I'm actually in the CIA. <laughs> Make an investigate plus intellect check. Okay. <laughs> That's not what I want to see me go. Uh, five. So <clears throat> you don't find... Super. You don't find any kind of identification on this guy. Um, you do find that he was carrying a body pistol. Um, there is a uh, there is a wad of cash in in his inside pocket worth five thousand credits. Okay. And on his lapel, so, I'm sorry. What was that? Can I get a sense? Has the, has the weapon been discharged? It has not. It hasn't even been pulled out of. It hasn't even been pulled out of his shoulder holster. So there goes my self defense rage. De defense, okay. And on the lapel of his uh, tux jacket is a pin, an enamel pin, 
with a logo that you recognize. <clears throat> well, I'm glad I got to kill somebody from Jennifer. <laughs> so, I mean, you're you're in the uh, underbelly service tunnels. Usually, the only people that come down here are uh, technicians from the Scholar's Tower when they have to fix something, or um, smugglers or the like come down here to make deals and whatnot. But there's really nobody else around, and there's this body. Um, I mean, you could leave the body here or, you know, do whatever you want with it. <laughs> uh, well, obviously, I'm going to pocket the pistol. Okay. I might as well pocket the cash at this point. It could be a terrible idea later, but yeah. why the hell not? Uh, and then I think I'm going to, like, shield myself. Okay. Psionically against any, uh, like, uh, offensive telepathy or anything like that. Okay. Um, and try to GTFO. Okay. Wait, but before I go, I, can I search him for identification? So you, that was part of your investigation and you don't find yeah. any ID on him. Since I, since I spent so little, can I try again? Sure, I'll let you try again. Really, I, I mean, I feel like common sense would be like, there's got to be something on him. I'll keep looking. Okay. If I suck it up it's just as bad, I'll, I don't know, I'll snap a picture of his face and then move on. Oh, that's more like it. Mm -hmm. 14. Okay, so... You so do... I'm looking for ID or a com dot. Or something like that. You do find um, you so you do find his mobile phone or his mobile com. Um, it is locked, uh, sure. but uh, you find a uh, an i you you find a uh, security ID that basically denotes him as a. Um, I'm trying to think of the name for this. It, it's basically like a um, a corporate ambassador. Okay. Um, and then my last question is, do I have my comms? Since I was all dressed up and ready to go. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, oh, yeah. I have you, it unless someone took it off me. Yeah, no, you, you've got your mobile comm and your, your comm dot. Okay. I mean, I don't so know that I'm you'd going... be walking... I don't know that you'd be walking around with a comm dot, but you've you've at least got your your mobile comm. I don't think anybody sure. goes anywhere without a phone. So I'm going to like snap a picture of him and the and his badge, and uh, text it to Captain and say, apparently I've been a little tied up, heading your way, and then I'll start trying to find my way upstairs. Okay. Um. I assume you're you're going to want to clean up your your arm because it it is yeah. the arm that has your uh your it is your cybernetic arm with your combat blade. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'll wipe it off on a shirt. All right. And then get going. Just wipe it on his I'm back. Dressed in red. If I'm dressed in red, I'll swipe it off on myself. <laughs> so after go ahead and make a uh. Go make another recon plus intellect check. Uh, ten. Okay. So it takes you about another 15 minutes and you're able to find your way out from these tunnels. Uh, not a easy task. You've never, you've never had a reason to be down here. You've known that they exist. But you've never had a reason to be down here. You find your way out, um, and uh, you know, kind of clean yourself up as best you can. You know, in the in the nearest ladies' room, 
and uh, make your way to the ball. Um, okay. And you know, as people as you arrive, people are still coming in, and you know, there's there's obviously some guy at the door. That's his job is to announce people as they come in. Um, <clears throat> you know, so and so the bumpity umph uh, baron of what have you, um, and how do how would you like to be announced? Oh well, I know. Uh, you, they announce you as you come in. The he announces uh, out to the entire ball. Um, Ching Shi, uh, royal consort in waiting. Awesome. And uh, so everybody is is now present at the ball. Um, any any conversation between Beth and Ching Shi? And are you going to let the rest of the party know that Ching Shi just murdered somebody in her sleep? Maybe, allegedly. Maybe okay. it was staged. I'm putting motion. I'm putting like GPS trackers in in all of you. <laughs> you're <laughs> you're gonna chip everybody. <laughs> yeah, you need a chip so I can track you. Okay, so I only I only told Captain. I okay. only sent the message to Captain, so Captain can decide what to do with the information. Um, if there's anywhere we can all get together, we need to get our story straight, for one thing. Yeah, because, I mean, it was noticed that Ching Shi wasn't at the ball on time. Yeah. So, I I can't claim to have seen her before then. But do you think there's there's no way there's cameras or anything in the service tunnels? Probably not, no. That's one mm -hmm. of the reasons why smugglers and bandits use the service tunnels. So who's the best liar out of our group? I think Ting. Whoever's got the highest persuasion. My guess would be Ting or Ox. Yeah. But I mean if no, you wanna no. if you wanna laugh, you could let Rexar do it. <laughs> I've, I've got a, I've got a, I've got a deception of one, and then I also I have a social of plus one and a charm of plus one. So if we got a bonus on our social due to this bringing in the big thing, I'll I'll have a plus two there probably. Yeah, that's true. Um, that is a good. That is a very good point. Everybody can add one to their social. So whatever your your total social score is, you can add one to it because that bringing in the Rasputin is a big deal. All right, then yeah, I'll have a I'll have a plus three to my deception roll or persuasion roll, either one. Okay, so you guys need to decide where you saw Ching Shi and when. I'm guessing, like, outside the place, maybe hiding out before going in. Maybe she looked nervous. She's nervous about the ball, about being announced or whatever. Okay. Um. Yeah, I'm, I'm a scallywag who's not sure I want to be tied down. Yeah. Do you want me to do you want me to tell him that, or do you want me just to come up with a lie that why you were late? Um, either way, or or uh, something else. I'm just thinking of like what would be believable that I don't know that I'm ready to for this commitment. Important <clears throat> thing is that if cops get you in three rooms, they get three same story. That's the important thing. Well, it's I'm very sorry for your loss, Jim. See your grandmother passing. Uh, has definitely upset you, and I saw that it got your stomach upset. And that is why you did not make it here. Uh, uh, gosh, uh, that's, that's probably the reason why you're not ready to get married just yet, because you're in a period of mourning. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. That's pretty good. Ting. Ting, go ahead and make a deception check. <laughs> deception plus your choice, social or charm, and uh, you can make that with a boon. Uh, 
Oh, I'm sorry. I've got to roll one more d6. It's got to be better than a one. <laughs> <laughs> a four. So four and five is nine, plus three is twelve. That's twelve. Okay. So, <clears throat> as Ting is saying this rather loudly, uh, loud enough that people around can hear, right? Over uh, Ching Shi's shoulder, uh, you hear, "Oh, darling, is is that why you were you weren't acting yourself last night?" She and Princess Rao comes up and kind of hooks her arm with Ching Shi, and she she says, "She was acting rather strangely last night, and uh, I I was so worried." Uh, you know, she just wasn't acting herself. This that explains so much. She says, uh, uh, "Don't Can worry." Can I get a read on if she's being sincere or if she's just going along with it? Yeah, go ahead and make a uh, go ahead and make a deception plus intellect check. Okay. Or do you want me to do it uh, telepathically? You could do that too. Okay. Your choice. I'll do it telepathically. I mean, yeah. If I'm gonna, if I'm going to be betrothed to the person, then she might as well know that I'm spying on it. Well, she'll only know if you fuck it up. <laughs> oh, fair enough. Okay, let's see. Seven. I think I just made it eight. Okay. Um. She is being deceptive. Um, okay. So. But you're not, even telepathically, you're not getting the whole story. You, sure. you are getting uh, images that you were indeed with Princess Rao last night, um, doing what you probably were going, thinking you were doing. But then after that, um, somebody else came to her apartment. Um, a Dark-skinned, dark-haired man. Okay. And that's the last that you remember. Um, but from her, what you're picking up telepathically from her is that uh, she turned to you and said, take care of the problem. And that's the last thing that, that you get. Oh, okay. Okay. And I want to Rex are to try and make all the bloodthirsty Ihati go to Ergo. Because then everybody wins. Yeah. Now I got to look at Ergo. That's like the Mad Max world. We have oh, the yes. Mechanical spiders. Yeah, you had, you had plans for that anyways. Um, so... Uh, if yeah, uh, Rexar. Uh, so <laughs> Beth is trying to convince. That's right, Ergo. Shit, I forgot all about Ergo. So uh, the Mad Max planet. Um, uh, she, Beth wants you to convince them that you know Ergo is a great spot. <laughs> how how do you want to go about that? Me or Rexar. Rexar. Oh, okay. Are you there, Rexar? Maybe not. <laughs> well, you should probably tell him that like only the best warriors could conquer Ergo, which is pretty true because it's full of radiation and freaks and monsters, so... <laughs> yeah, they do have a lot of gigantic robot spiders. Yeah, and people made special radiation. Uh, Corey, are you muted? Hold on a second. <laughs> I 
heard it today. So, <clears throat> Rexar goes over and is discussing with the uh, Aslan heads. Is there anybody that you guys want to go and mingle with? Oh, he's back. So, Rexar... Um, Sorry, I had to pee. No problem. So, <clears throat> so the captain wants you to try and convince the, the three Aslan heads that uh, it would be an excellent target for the Ihati to invade Ergo, the, the Mad Max planet. Uh, okay, uh, uh, bring the three Aslan heads together and say, you didn't hear this from me, but <laughs> Ergo would be a great place to earn some glory, prime planet for a, a great battle. Go ahead and make a um, persuasion, oh god, is it deception plus territory? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm not lying. It would be a good place for battle. That's true. You go ahead, you, your choice, either deception or persuasion plus territory. We'll go with persuasion because I have a zero in that. Uh, plus my four from my clan. That is a twelve. Okay, so <clears throat> these three Aslan heads are fairly interested. Um, one of these people, one of these Aslan, no, don't laugh because I'm probably going to butcher his name, um, is an individual named I see Ool, and... Uh, to the rest of you, <clears throat> I see you all, uh, all you, you basically know him as some kind of Aslan noble, um, Aslan leader. Um, Rexar would be the first to tell you that Aslan don't really have nobles. Um, that's just, no, the whole concept of nobility is not something they really do. Um, but his status is vague. Um, it's, it's not uncommon for Aslan to flaunt their clan affiliations or their rank within a clan, um, as part of their defining characteristics, but a seal never, never seems to do this. Um, on a few rare occasions that he's answered questions on the subject, he's given a variety of names for his clan and never the same clan name twice. But for some reason in the Trojan Reach, this guy is really important. And none of you, including Rexar, can really figure out why. Um, but he is known uh, pretty heavily for making use of private couriers and mercenaries um, and a variety of experts for hire. He finds this information um, incredibly interesting. Um, now, he does bring up to Rexar, he says, but I thought that Ergo was a, a an irradiated wasteland full of mutants. Uh, um, mutants, yes, but they are capable warriors. He says, really? Well, this, this... They have all, all sorts of insane vehicles that... Uh, or deck out in all sorts of weaponry. It'd be a worthy challenge. So he turns to the other two. One is a uh, Aslan leader for the Tlaiawaha clan. The other is a Aslan leader for the Waui clan. And he says, um, well, this this uh, Rexar seems to be an honorable uh, Ihati himself. This could be uh, very doable. We we could perhaps focus on Ergo and, uh, you know, at least uh, cause this to be a bit of a pacification. Probably not a long-term resolution to the problem, but uh, at least a stopgap measure. 
for the rest of you, is there anybody else that you would like to chat with at the ball? Yes, I'd like to chat uh, with the captain, see if he wants to do another uh, poker game. And how how's that search you're doing coming? You find the any pirates yet? Any leads? Have you blasted them into space? Okay. Um, so go ahead and make a uh, persuasion plus soch uh, check. I'm rolling good tonight. Eleven. Okay. So this is this is really your first time meeting him, and you weren't with the group. Um, when they pulled off this heist that just, it, right. it, it did not go at all. I, I was going to say it didn't go as planned, but that would imply that they really had much of a plan. <laughs> Wasn't he at the party with the, at the Golden Palace? Uh, I think he played poker with him. No, this is a, that was a different guy. Um, different guy, got it. This, this guy is, uh, is he's this guy's in cap he's a captain of a much smaller ship he he's a captain of a um um of a patrol corvette um he doesn't have a fleet um uh, but he himself personally has taken on this almost religious like fervor trying to find the bastards that had the dare daring to actually assault uh, the emperor's treasure ship. And so, but he, he's impressed with your, with your, uh, um, he's impressed with you mostly because of your standing with Drynax. Um, he replies that, uh, that they have found a number of pirates. He says, uh, actually we, well, I believe we caught a pair of pirates that we believe were involved with those uh, brigands that assaulted His Majesty's uh, treasure ship, the Martin II. Uh, they weren't directly involved, uh, but we're, we were hoping to get more information out of them. Unfortunately, the court's ruling didn't go in our favor, and one of them was, was uh, sent out the airlock before we could get the information we wanted. Um, the other one, though, uh, she just recently gave birth, and I'm really hoping that we'll get some information out of her before uh, she meets a similar fate. Okay, good luck. Cool. Uh, you all drop names telling me I heard about the talk, was talking with the admirals and that over the Golden Palace, and uh, ho ho hopefully you can find them. It should be a good boost to your career. And it'll clear the spaceways for us uh, law-abiding people. <laughs> Man, you are laying it on thick. <laughs> you know what? I can do it. I but had no involvement with any supposed uh, robbery. Well, technically speaking, uh, neither did the two that he captured. So the two pirates that he captured, <clears throat> the group, had um, captured a... Uh, Captain Farrick Redthane, and uh, he was basically wanted for doing a raid on Torpal and a raid on Clark. His girlfriend, uh, Maria Silverhand, um, she was involved in that as well. And the deal was that they would get in good with the Lords of Thieve if they did away with the problem of Farrick Redthane. And so they captured Red Thane, and they convinced him that if he turned him... So the deal was that if he turned himself in, the uh, psychopomps of Torpal were going to carbon freeze him and put him in orbit around the planet as a uh, a warning against other pirate raids. And so they convinced him to do that and then told Maria Silverhand where he was so that she could come in and pick up his frozen body and thaw him out. And that was that was not as successful as they had hoped, and they both got captured. Um, the rest of Farrakh Red Thane's pirate band was absorbed into their fleet, which is where a good portion of their ships have come from. Um, so 
he he relates, you know, that story um, more or less minus who they were really attached to because he's still not sure. But he's hoping that his current um, his current legal motion in the courts will do a stay of execution for Maria Silverhand so that they can continue to question her about uh, her affiliations. I'll let uh, our captain know about that as soon as I can. A, I'm not going to bust in it during the ball, but I'll let her know in case uh, an accident in prison needs to be arranged. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, because, yeah, Maria Silverhand knows too much. Uh, or, or, you know, if there's victims that need to come forward and demand that she be executed right away. But that's above my pay grade. I'll pass that on to the captain. I was, I was actually thinking about wanting to try to to kidnap the captain and see if if we could make it look like the Asselon took him. Mm. I don't know. Framing the Aslan uh, for that could have some <clears throat> dire ramifications. Uh, probably worse than the fact that you've got an Imperial um, do-gooder hunting pirates. I mean, that... That could really, really blow up in your face. Yeah, but it it could also make the Imperium and the and the Aslan at least whichever one we pinned it on their their little clan. Uh, they might spend time uh, going at each other. We could, you know. That's true. It's just a thought, but uh, you know, if we if we were able to kidnap this guy. And put him on the Aslan ship with his little tinger finger or whatever, and the Corvette wiped out an Aslan ship to go get their guy that got kidnapped. You know, this is stashing the guy with him being unconscious for a day or two. I mean, how hard could that be? Give him a little tea and crumpet routine. I don't know. That's up to you guys. I don't, well, I mean, you know, you said big, big plays. That that would be one. That would make the news. It, it would make the news, but I think it might make the <laughs> the Aslan and the Imperium uh, a little upset with the Trojan Reach. Oh, they, well, I don't know if they'd be mad at the Trojan Reach if we just if they're mad at each other. They're less to do business. They, the more military altercations we could get them to do. Uh, it would be really easier to beat the winner. I don't know if Mara Silverhand's going to talk because if she hasn't said anything by now, I don't know. Yeah, she's what been sitting in jail for to... over nine months. Yeah, and then she tortured her already and all that shit, so... I don't, if we, I don't what if we know... What the captain and trade him out for Silverhand with a, 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 an exchange... Brokered through one of our pirate lord friends. We gotta figure. Well, you know what? I want to solve the problem where Ching Shi like loses all memory and murders people first. I mean, that's at the top of my list because we might be next. We don't actually <laughs> know that she murdered people, but right. I mean, you're calling it a problem. I mean, is it a problem or an opportunity? <laughs> We do got a we do got a Jadeco body we have to remove from. Well, I mean, I don't know that, don't know that we would have to remove him. I mean, if his if his dead body's found in the underworld seedy part of the palace, I mean, don't go to the seedy under part unless you want to get stabbed, right? Like. <coughs> It's not like he was stabbed standing two feet away from me in the ballroom full of people. That's true. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just a body in the place where most bodies probably end up. Right. Are there any Ogmen around that we can send to go eat it? <laughs> oh! <laughs> it is my representatives to the Raiders and tell them to head to the basement. There's a snack waiting for them. Right? Yeah, yeah no, there's no, there's no Ogmen here. Um... Yeah, no. So that that's that's one of the other pieces of news that are that is floating around. 
um, that uh, there's a lot of talk about how um, there was a lot of hope that that Ogma was actually going to basically pull their head out of their collective asses, and uh, you know all the the Ogman clans were going to to um, unite behind Chief Hannigan, and uh, but as so often is the case with Ogman raiders, they uh, murdered the Chief Hannigan and are now back to infighting and going back to raiding. And so um, there's a lot of talk about that around the uh, ballroom as well. Um, and a lot of that conversation is that they have you guys to thank for uh, placating the uh, Chief Hannigan because in the past, what, year and a half, raids have been down because Hannigan was trying to actually be a good person and actually rule rather than just stealing everything and now that's all gone to shit so um but like they like i said you guys are to thank for a lot of that for the past year and a half i guess that's the longest stretch of them doing well right right um, sure so the ball kind of concludes. Um, you've all uh, eaten your fill, and you kind of get back to your royal suites and um, kind of meet up to to uh, sync up your information. Um, now <clears throat> you have some options here, so you could. Wait for the the body to be found in in the in the uh, access tunnels. You could go and find an open door and you know kick the body out and be like, okay, well, good riddance to bad rubbish. Or you could be like, you know what? Let's make this somebody else's problem and just go get on get go board. Uh, Capri Sun and head to Tech World and just be like, well, it wasn't us. We weren't even in town that week. <laughs> I'm a fan of the the latter. Just peace outing. I don't want to spend more time here if if somehow I've been turned into a sleeper assassin, unbeknownst to me, I'd like to spend as little time at the palace as possible until I figure out what happened. Well, it's your corpse, so I'll respect your decision. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so, so you guys are going to... I'm personally all for peace outing. I would like to make a purchase before we left, Okay. if I could. What would you like to buy? Uh, um, I actually wanted to buy that Pioneer battle dress armor. You can, could. You can put in a... Um, Order to Rashondo. So Rashondo's question. Wow, it's just you just want Pioneer Battle Dress. Um. Well, I mean, it's got that. It's got that sensor suite built in. That. So Pioneer Battle the, Dress is more like an industrial combat version. Pioneer Battle Dress. Yeah. The Combat Pioneer. It's a TL thirteen protection twenty three. That right there that's that's what i want to buy so yeah the only reason i ask is pioneer oh yeah 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 i see it combat pioneer but it's slightly heavier than general yeah it's got the specialist package so basically it's for detecting explosives and things like that. Right. Which would be a great thing to have as we cruise around. So Rashondo could uh, get this. Um, 270,000 credits is what it would cost you. Yeah, I have it. I'll okay. Pay it. 
So go ahead and pay it. The next time you are back at the uh, floating palace, he will have uh, Pioneer Combat Battle Brass for you. Okay. He, Thank you. He says he's not sure where he's going to acquire this, but it will be available. <laughs> Thank you. So, Ching Shi, go ahead and make an astrogation check. Astrogation plus intellect or education, your choice. Eight. Okay. And go ahead and make a piloting plus dex check. Well. Okay. So you guys next morning board up uh, the Harrier and uh, it is, the bridge is way super nice now. And uh, <clears throat> Ching Shi uh, plots the course and takes off from the floating palace and about 48 hours later, you are at the 100 jump point limit. Uh, Keith, you can make a engineering J drive plus intellect or EDU, and you get a plus two to that. Did you say a plus three? Plus two. Plus two, okay. 14. <laughs> nice. And so the Harrier, jumps and you will be in jump space let me take a look here and I'll tell you how many weeks it's going to take you I think it's on this map I hope it's on this map there we go so you are at Dredax oh maybe it's not on this map shit It's on one of these. Hold on. There we go. Jumps. So let's see here. One, two jumps. So you will be in jump space for two weeks with a small layover at Hilfer, which that's not exciting. Um, so yeah, we will pick this up next week with you arriving at Tech World to see what this invitation is all about. All right, see you guys. Thank so I know you. I know there was wasn't uh, I know there wasn't a whole lot of uh, uh, action in this particular portion, but this is this is one of those games that had to be done. I like to call these the uh, the cleanup. Uh, sessions because yeah. you kind of have to get all of that information back together, tie up some loose ends before you can kind of move on. I don't mind when it's all story. Yeah, it's okay. yeah. right on. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yep, have a good night, guys. I will see you next week at seven o'clock. All right, good night.